My guest today on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast is Tara O'Grady. Tara is a singer, songwriter, author, and intuitive educator who calls herself a bliss ambassador. We're going to find out all about that on today's episode. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Tara O'Grady, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And I love how you put on a slight Irish accent when you say my name. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> it, it just comes out, you know. Yes, but <laughs> you great. have you're a member of the O Club as well. I am, in fact, yes. O'Brien O'Grady. And that's why we have a green background for you today as well. So yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm wearing green today. I that noticed, wasn't, yes. that wasn't really intentional. Little bits of green in here. Yes. Well, it wasn't intentional, but, you know, it just comes out, doesn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> so, there's so always a bit of green. green. Always a bit of green. So tell us about what this is. I mean, I know that you're a singer and songwriter. I've seen and heard you perform many times. You're wonderful. Um, you're an author. You've written three, four books at this point. Oh, quite ambitious. I, I, I have uh, one book is already published and the second one uh, just went to the publisher last week. OK, well, when I saw you last, I thought you said three or four. No, I writing? said I had the third. I was writing the third. OK, yes. OK, good. Good. So you're also an intuitive educator and a bliss ambassador. Could you tell us a little bit more about an intuitive educator is? Well, uh I have, I actually have my, my master's in education. So I've always been a, an educator and it was primarily um, literature and the arts. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the intuition part uh, came later when I started connecting to my own intuition and realizing that I had to pay attention uh, to my dreams and to the synchronicities uh, and to my gut, uh, because there is so much happening around us uh, with the sixth sense. And I learned how to develop that. And as soon as I did, then my life became magical and everything started falling into place. Well, I, I can certainly vouch for the fact that your um, life seems pretty magical. I will I will hit that for that. So um, it's just as an example, when I saw you, we were both attending a, a film in, in Kingston, bumped into you there for just the other day for a, a film called um, Master of Disguise or something like that. Brilliant. Um, brilliant, brilliant disguise. Thank you. And and um, I, I bought, because they were selling them, this t toffee, just because it was there. Um, it was called Houdini Toffee. And my friend Frank, who was there, said, oh, you know, I, I used to love Houdini. I studied him when I was a kid. I read his books. I loved Houdini. And I said, and then you go on <laughs> and you say, well, I have, I had Houdini's Bible signed by Houdini. And because my, I don't know, you tell the story. My, my mother's neighbor um, worked for Houdini's brother, who was a doctor in Manhattan. And uh, my mother's neighbor was a nurse and uh, Houdini's father collected religious texts of every kind and his family would sign them. So it was signed in 1893 by the father and also by Houdini. But his real name, Houdini, Harry Houdini, was his stage name. Right. The Hungarian from Budapest, his real name was uh, Eric Weiss. And so that's who signed it. And that's why it was so valuable. Um, but I had it my whole childhood sitting on the shelf. And I remember playing Barbies with my friends in the living room. And I'd say, you know, that's Harry Houdini's Bible. And they were like, who's Harry Houdini? Like, like these kids didn't know. And I don't think I knew. But eventually I knew that we we had to sell it one day and that it was valuable. But um, we didn't know how because this was pre-internet. 
Mm -hmm. So one day, one day I was exercising in a cemetery, if you can believe it, because Queens is filled with uh, so many dead people. And um, I was walking around and I took a picture of a tombstone and I posted it on Facebook and a fan of my music said, hey, is Harry Houdini buried there? And I said, no. But that's when I remembered, hey, there's a Bible sitting on my parents' bookshelf and it belongs to him. And now I have the Internet and I know how to sell it. So I was able to sell it um, to a museum in Budapest. Uh, called the Harry Houdini Museum, and uh, they invited me over to uh, present it to the Hungarian government, and they invited the Irish government, and they had me perform on stage, and so it was a magical experience altogether. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and I had very good toffee. It was really, it disappeared really quickly. So, um... <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So getting back to your intuitive education stuff, you do have a very magical life, I will say. It's it's quite remarkable. You you are also a bliss ambassador. You you sponsor tours of Ireland and things like that. Is that accurate? Yes. I uh, A number of years ago, uh, a tour operator um, invited me to bring my band to Ireland um, uh, to perform. And he, he, he would bring... A, Irish bands uh, with their fans to Ireland. And I started doing that. And uh, then I realized I liked organizing the experiences and um, I stopped bringing my band and I started making uh, the experiences about connecting to Ireland um, in different ways, whether it was through the food or through the sacred landscape. Um, and I, I, I hosted a recent one in September uh, 2022, and I called it a wellness retreat. And uh, I invited anyone who wanted to connect to the the energy of Ireland, because I do feel that there is a different uh, energy there than in New York or anywhere else in the world. Um, the, I think the people are really connected to the land, and there's you can just sense uh, the spirit there and the energy force. And so that could be why they filmed in three locations there, the new Star Wars films. <laughs> the force is real over there. It's really intense. And, and um, you know, recently we had Halloween. And ha Halloween actually came from uh, the ancient Celts because they, they had a, a sense that the veil between worlds was thin. And especially on October 31st. Um, and... All, it's all Celtic, yeah, it's the Celtic New Year. And so uh, November 1st is the Celtic New Year. It's the beginning of the new year in the Celtic calendar. Um, so, um, so yeah, yes. so Ireland is where I want to um, help people connect to their intuition. Um, and it's it, it, the people who came on my gr uh, group tour, uh, they all had different reasons for being there, you know, uh, different uh, levels of um, uh, awakening and their journey on this life on earth. And, and you know, some people were uh, dealing with uh, some, you know, challenging life experiences and others just wanted to focus on their creativity because I also uh, teach people how to do that to awaken the creative genius within because so many of us are not picking up our crayons anymore and connecting to the inner child and that playfulness uh, and that the child who believes in you that anything is possible and the future is ahead of you and you know you can do anything and you have super ha power uh, abilities and we actually do and we forget these things so that's what I've been teaching my clients uh, to connect to their intuition and that inner child so they can go out and conquer the world. Cool. Now, do you do that privately as coaches, as a coach as well? Do you do that with people one on one? Yes, on my butterflycoach.org site, uh, people mm -hmm. contact me if they uh, need help with anything, whether it's their creativity, their writing, um, even interpreting their dreams. If they have nightmares, I once had a, a a musician call me all the way from. They were on tour, I think. 
I don't know, were they in Singapore or China, but they were on an, uh, an Asian tour. And, and apparently the, the pianist was having dreadful nightmares. He could not function. He couldn't perform at, at each night. He was failing on stage and he was um, a sideman in the group. And, and so the band leader asked sax player um, to do something. And he said, Tara O'Grady knows how to interpret dreams or can help us in some way. Cause he was always hearing me talk about my dreams when I was, you know, backstage. And so they called me from Asia and he, they put the pianist on the phone and they said, um, can you help this guy? Cause he's losing his mind. He just, he was having such terrible nightmares. And um, so he, I just asked him, explain your dream to me. And he did. And uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about you, but if it were my dream, then I explained to him what the symbols meant to me. And he, he they resonated, the meaning resonated with him. And, and he kind of had an aha moment. He's like, oh my gosh, you're right. So he was able to perform after that and the tour was successful and they thanked me profusely, but it was just funny to get a random call from a band on tour going, we're having nightmares, help us. <laughs> so, you know, it's it, all we have to do, like we don't even know how to, uh, our, our psyche is always sharing information with us and we don't even know how to read the language of our souls. And that's what dreams are. They're, they're images, uh, our, our soul speaks to us uh, through uh, visual imagery and these symbols, language of the soul. And so once you learn how to interpret uh, those visual symbols, just like Egyptian hieroglyphics or any other, you know, signs on the road, on the road, on your life journey, then you're like, oh, I can read this language now and I can figure out what I'm doing and what I'm afraid of and what I should be doing. And it's kind of awesome. How did you come to learn to be able to do that? You said you had a master's in education. Yes. So, so not all of this is purely intuitive, I'm guessing, um, because, you know, you've had a master's in education. So you studied a lot about education, about about the pedagogy, I'm assuming. Um, where Where is this? This is this part of your education. Did you learn how to interpret dreams? What, Tell me more. Is this? I feel that my master's, my master's in education, just taught me how to write a lot of papers, and mm. and I, I I I I actually didn't feel that I learned much uh, from it because it didn't prepare me to go into the classroom, and and that was all, you know, jump into the water and learn how to swim when it actually happened. So I taught high school, college, and then eventually I taught adults um, uh, at art institutions all over, and. Mm. Um, and so the the dreams I remember I, I I remember waking up from a dream when I was about 20 years old and I was still living uh, in my parents' house at the time. And the dream that woke me up in the middle of the night it was actually more of a voice with a message and I woke up and I wrote the message down. And then I went back to sleep. And when I got up that morning and I saw the piece of paper on my bedside table and I read the chicken scratch, because, you know, you're writing in the dark, it said, your worth is determined by your service to others. Hmm. And I realized at that young age that that was a very profound message and that it didn't come from me. I knew that it wasn't me and myself talking to myself in a dream. It, it felt like it was more of a, a guide or a teacher. And I knew it was important. And I kept that piece of paper. But then I went on with my life, you know, and I, I ignored, I just went on with my development. And uh, I, it must have been, I, I, I suppose I had another dream, maybe a few years later. And when I started paying attention to my dreams, I would write down the dreams that stood out and that would be maybe once every six months. But then when I realized that what I wrote down, if sometimes it would, um, it, it would come true a few months later, like exactly, you know, the dialogue and the action and the, and the symbols visually, I would see them. So as soon as I started realizing there was a pattern and that I was, um, there were synchronicities and things like that. I, I started writing them down every day. Mm -hmm. And so I've been writing my dreams for 20 years. So once, when you make anything a practice, 
you start paying attention uh, to them because then you can go back to um, a dream that was a month ago or a year ago and and then see see what it meant for um, your present life. And it's fascinating once you start to analyze anything, almost like a, a scientist in a lab where they're taking data. You know, I've got all the books, I've got all the research, it's all there. And um, I think uh, it, when I got extremely serious about it, it's because a dream led me to the awareness of an actual organization that studies dreams. Oh. So so I, I had a dream uh, that I was on, on the cover of a magazine wearing uh, gold glittery fancy pants, like something Diana Ross might have worn, you know, on stage. <laughs> And so in the morning, um, I researched uh, the dream symbol. I used to not trust my intuition and, 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 and Google, you know, dream of cover of magazine to see what that meant instead mm -hmm. of trusting my intuition and thinking of what it meant to me. And up popped a dream magazine related to this organization, the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And I was like, wow an organization and it's official and they were having a conference in the Netherlands. So I bought a plane ticket and I registered for the conference. And as I was flying there, this is where it got crazy. As I was flying to the conference to Europe, um, the magazine in the pocket in front of this, in the seat in front of me on the cover was a musician friend of mine wearing the gold pants from my dream. But when I opened the magazine, there was an article about me in the in the magazine so i realized ah uh, this <laughs> this is coming true so that's how a lot of my dreams uh, i realized were um precognitive which means you're going to dream about something that happens in the future and in the past when i was younger and I had a deja vu moment you know when you're you, you'll be in a store and you're like wait a minute i saw this aisle and i had this conversation with this stranger and i'm having a deja vu moment it's usually a dream that you had that you forgot, but it, um, right. you've you've already seen it before, and that's I understood that's where deja vu came from. Wow, it's absolutely fascinating. You know, a number of years ago, I was um, I had a therapist who was a Jungian psychologist, who was a really wonderful man named David, um, and I would write down my dreams. I wrote down my dreams every night. I had a dream journal, and very often the therapy was about. Um, the dreams that I'd had that week. And what was really amazing about it was that um, he had a, a bookshelf behind him with all these Jungian books and other books. And um, and I'd, I'd tell him the dream and he'd go like, okay. First you say, and what, what associations do you have with that dream? What What's coming from inside you that would remind you associations with that, et cetera. We'd talk about that for a while. And he'd talk about his associations and that sort of thing. But, but you know, it, it also reminds me of something. Hold on one moment. And he'd go over to his bookshelf and he'd look through all the different books. And he'd, he'd pick one book out from that was a Jungian dream book or whatever. I don't know. And, and he'd turn a book about Jung by many other people who have written books. But he'd open to a certain page and he'd say, here, read this paragraph. And, and he'd have a little dot next to it. So it, was, it wasn't the first time he'd done this, but a little dot. And then it would have this paragraph about exactly the dream imagery that I had just had, you know, about a white horse eating yellow dandelions or something. And it would be like, oh my God, <laughs> it was just like the collective unconscious kind of speaking mm -hmm. to you. Like oh, yeah. this, this message that is, you know, Jung was so much involved in symbols, as you mentioned before, dreams are, are symbols. Are, um, she was so much involved in symbols and archetypes that these mm -hmm. the symbols that have been around for generations and you know many 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 generations since the dawn of time perhaps um, are still alive in us they still vibrate and have this aliveness within us and so they they, they speak they have a, 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 a I don't know a frequency that speaks to us so it sounds like that's kind of the same thing that you're tapping into Yes, that, and that's why I would look up the archetypes and the symbols uh, of what everyone before me had said. This is what it means when you dream of a white horse, or this is what white means. This is what horse means. This is uh -huh. what the dandelion means. But then I realized um, it took me a while. You know, just like with anything, you have to first learn how to. Even with when I uh, became a writer, you know, you're taught to write. Um, 
in literature class, you take writing workshops, uh, you're taught what to do, but at, they say that you can't, you know, you have to develop your own style and you can't uh, break the rules until you learn how to write first and then break the rules and write in your own style after that. So I found that even with dream work, that once I learned the archetypes and what the symbols meant with the collective unconscious, uh -huh. then I had to trust my intuition and understand what that symbol meant to me. Because if you dream of a dog, you have a different impression of what a dog is than I do. And you might you might love dogs. I'm actually afraid of dogs because mm -hmm. throughout my childhood, I was chased by them and bitten by them. So when I dream of a dog, it's a fearful thing as opposed to someone else dreaming of a dog and it's a guide or a, a protector, a, help, a helpful friend in your dream. Right. So, so that's why you have to trust your intuition. Like, what does this mean to me? Right. Um, right. And exactly. so it's, that's, it's fascinating though. And, and you could, you could analyze dreams to the end of time. Like you, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into them. And, and so um, I've started collaborating with um, other creatives uh, such as this painter, uh, Amy Lloyd, who's from Chicago. And she, she has a, an olive farm in Tuscany and we're going to be teaching a dream workshop called the art of dreaming in Tuscany. Uh, next April, and uh, all the information's on my website. And um, sh she, you know, she'll um, she'll paint her dreams, and I write about my dreams. So we're combining the art of writing and uh, drawing to go deeper into it because it's it's you could write your dream in your journal the next morning, but if you drew your dream, you'd be blown away by what comes on the paper and how you didn't see that until you saw it. So hmm. you could have an idea of what your dream meant. And then once you see it visually, it has a, it, 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 drawing it has a whole new level of understanding. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, in fairness to, to David as well, you know, he had that whole bookshelf. He was looking for a particular book because of that dream, probably going back to your metaphor about dogs. Um, Probably there was a, in his bookshelf, there was a bunch of books that have dreams about horses or sections about horses. And he picked the one that was pertinent to my dream about horses. But yes, symbols are symbolic for many people in lots of different ways. So what is it symbolic for you is the most important thing. And, and it's really interesting what you just said about um, seeing it as a visual. Because when you're drawing things as well, you're definitely tapping into another part of your brain. You know, you're definitely tapping into another part of your your understanding and intuition that things will be coming out that way that are different than the verbal cognitive sort of thing. So, and probably true with music too, I would imagine. Do you find that's true when you put a melody to something, when you write a song, that it changes or influences the lyrics somehow? Or is there is there a correlation? Um. Yeah, I mean, everything, like you could say it's like saying that nothing is ever finished it's always in the process of becoming and and whether it's a song that you're writing or a painting you're making and and even the understanding of a dream it, um it's it's almost like the beginning of, of a film that you're watching and you can add to it I, um i've learned through attending these um dream conferences uh, with, there's all kinds of people there. They're psychologists and sci doctors uh, who study the brain and um, uh, other folks who can actually dream about um, seeing the, the, um, the illness within some their patients' bodies. They'll see them in their dreams. And uh, there's uh, this one woman who, she's the only, um, person in the world who has a PhD in lucid dreaming, uh, Dr. Claire uh, Johnson. She lives in Portugal, but she's from the UK. And I took a workshop of hers once. Um, and that's very important if for coaches to constantly keep taking workshops with other professionals, because you learn so much uh, and that can help your practice as well. And hmm. uh, I took a workshop of hers once. Um, and she she asked us to revisit a nightmare that we had. So sit there in your chair, close your eyes and go back into the dream. Envision the nightmare, envision whatever it is, that scary thing that was chasing you. 
And then she has you change the ending as if you're the author, which you are. You're the author of your life. You can make anything happen. Um, and she she has you turn it into a positive thing uh, or to face the scary, uh, dark shadow, demon, whatever it is that's chasing you, the monster, mm -hmm. and, and just say, what information do you have for me? What do you want to share with me? Right. And, and I've told, and I've, that was so helpful hearing that from her and then doing that practice and changing the ending of my dream uh, because it gives you the power and you realize you have total control over everything. And, and once you feel empowered to do that, then you feel like you can do anything. Yeah, that's great. And that again is a Jungian process as well. That's something that Carl Jung used to do. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but same same ideal process, which again shows that nothing's new under the sun, but it's wonderful to discover it and rediscover it. And you're absolutely right. Um, the, the most successful people for some reason seem to always be learning new things from new people and taking more workshops. And um, when I studied NLP as an example, I didn't just take one course, I took like five um, courses from different people teaching the same thing. You know, I got an NLP certification course from like five different people. Um, but that was great because even though they were ostensibly teaching the same thing, they taught it differently and I learned it differently. And then, uh, you know, the ones that certain techniques resonated with me, like, wow, I do it that way. And I do this with this person stuff. And yeah, we all have different learning styles and we, we also gravitate to different, uh, teaching styles and, you know, some people, we, some of us like to learn things through audiovisual. Others want to read it, and it's the same with your students and your clients. So they're they're gonna they're gonna gravitate towards how they can um, process the information best. And so yeah. you yourself, as a practitioner, you have to keep uh, studying and learning and growing and training and be, uh, keeping yourself curious so that you can learn all these other ways of approaching and sharing. Uh, the same information. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I would go further than that, actually. And I'd say that even though you have, you gravitate towards the thing that is comfortable or familiar to you, that you will get a lot out of doing it differently. Like you were talking about before, when you write down your dreams, that's, that's great. And if you draw your dreams or paint your dreams with colors and things, it can be very much enlightening. It's not my usual thing. I like to write things, but it's steps outside of your usual and you get even deeper insight. I, I like to learn auditorily. It's like, okay, well, let's learn visually for a dip, for a yeah, change. So, so speaking of that, I've started using this fluorescent pink pen, right? Oh, wow. in yeah. in my dream journal. So this is my this is my current dream journal, which is turquoise, and I have a butterfly on it because I'm a butterfly coach. It even matches my nails. <laughs> I'm loving the color <laughs> turquoise. So, um, so this is this is the. Uh, the new dream journal but i've been i've been writing in a this pink uh, fluorescent pen and what's amazing is that now <laughs> with the pink pen i'll write what i want to folk like the the symbols that i really want to uh, figure out what they mean like let's say your your white horse and your yellow dandelions and there might have been a ton of other things that happened in that dream but i circle with this pen the white horse the yellow dandelions dandelions now when i dream things will appear in the dream that are this color as if my psyche is saying this is the symbol we want you to pay attention to when you wake up so i am seeing like uh, the other night i had a dream about all these brown um ducks a female uh duck going up river and one of the ducks was this color <laughs> and I was like what that stood out and so when things stand out in your dream it, your your psyche oh, is great. asking you to pay attention and 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 so that I that kind of blew my mind so I, I I love waking up I love going to bed at night because I can't wait to dream because I I just it's like you have no idea where you're going to go who you're going to meet and what you're going to learn about yourself and the universe and that is so exciting Oh, that's great. I love that. Fluorescent <laughs> chartreuse ducks. Swimming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, look that up in your Jungian books, Mr. Bennett. You know. <laughs> well, what I realize is that I'm already 
uh, translating dreams within dreams. Like I'm, I'm aware my, yeah. my psyche is aware that I'm going to try to interpret this when I wake up and it's already trying to do it while I'm in the dream. And it's kind of, it's, I'm not, uh, I've been lucid in dreams, but this is not, um, I'm not awake when you're lucid in a dream. It means you become awake and aware that you're dreaming and that's right. not happening. It's just that, um, it's almost like you're getting like flashing lights going, look, pay attention. This is important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. For sure. That's really great. Now tell me something. Um, you said one of your earlier dreams you were talking about that it didn't come from you. That it's, mm -hmm. um, so where's it coming from? I believe uh, uh, in spirit guides. And okay. that we're, we're often being guided and uh, we have what I call a dream team and there's at least five of them and some of them are ascended masters uh, assigned to at birth. Uh, some are ancestors, some are spirit guides, spirit animals, um, uh, archangels, all kinds of uh, uh, beings of, of illumination that are um, helping us along on our journey. And they do not um, interfere uh, uh, until you ask for their assistance. So um, we have free will, we, we do our thing, we can go out and, you know, do crazy things, jump off of uh, bungee jumps and do all these things and whatever you want to do. Uh, but as soon as you ask for some guidance and help, they will come along and um, offer that to you. And and so I started paying attention to signs in my waking life. Um, and that's that that's more about the intuition, just being aware of everything around you, because, you know, it, it's not just what we're experiencing here on this uh this this plane on this earth. There's there's many dimensions and. The dream work is part of that. And um, so I was definitely getting a, a guidance and a message, which is a really deep message, a, a, a life purpose type of message. And the message was your worth is determined by your service to others. And so um, I was not mature enough when I received that dream, but I understood that it was powerful and that I, I kind of sense that I, I would understand it later in life. And now I completely understand what it means. So that's why I then became a life coach, bliss ambassador, butterfly coach, teaching people to spread their wings. You know, I had this vision of myself when I was a child. And I knew that I was in a cocoon. Like I always saw everything in symbols. And I knew that I was contained and growing in this cocoon and not yet ready. And I knew one day I would be a butterfly, become a butterfly and transform uh, into um, another being, uh, another level of understanding. And I knew that I had so much time to, to go and experiences to go through to uh, participate in that metamorphosis. But I understood it on a deep level, even as a child. And yeah, it was frustrating knowing that I had to be contained in the cocoon and wait for the development to happen. And so when I uh, became uh, the butterfly and spread my wings, that's when I anointed myself butterfly coach because uh, I wanted to help other people get to that level of understanding um, that we are here to experience all of these challenges and obstacles on our life journey so that we can learn lessons of love, compassion, forgiveness, so that we can grow and morph into these extraordinary beings that we are destined to be. And so many of us are living in the dark and not realizing we have wings. And it, it just takes uh, a lot of growth and life experience to discover that. And that's where I'm at. And that's what I'm trying to share with others. Cool. So how do you know that your wings got spread? How do you know that you burst out of the butterfly? What there's in, in the world the work that I do, the NLP world, um, there's a thing about having a well-formed outcome, 
where you have to say specifically what it is that you want, because sometimes if it's not specific, you're like, I want happiness or I want more money. And it's like, well, how much more money specifically? Here's a dollar. Is that enough? You know, it's like, well, that's more money. That's what you asked for. So you want to be real clear on what it is that you're going for. So you get very clear about the outcome. So it's sensory specific. It's stated that positive because sometimes they might get there and not know that they've gotten there. So I want to burst forth and be, be a, a, a butterfly, not a caterpillar. How will I know when I've done that? How will I know that I've spread my wings and that I've burst forth and I'm no longer a caterpillar and now I'm a butterfly? Well, it's a, it's a process just as uh, um, the, 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 the butterfly as it morphs it's a full process and it's it's a long process and but it's it's part of um an awakening and awareness of everything that's grander and outside of your own self-centered being and so it 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 happens in little spurts uh you know the, and I, in my first book i i write about it in migrating toward happiness um, I write about how I started becoming aware of um, things like, um, for example, my grandmother's spirit physically came to me and scared the hell out of me after she died. So that was like, whoa, so that's all real, that other side of the veil. And, and you know, I always assumed it was uh, real, but it, until you experience it, you don't believe it. You know, there's plenty of people who say, I don't believe in ghosts. But as soon as uh, one appears to you, you're like, oh, okay, it's real. <laughs> Please never do that again. Thank you. And so um, there was that. And um, and uh, then I started seeing the number 11 everywhere. 11, hmm. 11, 11 on a clock. Uh, and that is a, a, a sign uh, of part of the awakening um, and the realization that there's there's you're being communicated with on a on another level and then everything was like the number 11 was everywhere and it was even i'd be sitting in my car and the license plate in front of me i would add up the numbers and it added up to 11 every time <laughs> and so i started collecting license plates like an obsessed person and i was even in uh, key west a couple of years ago and a friend of mine who was always going over to cuba he had a license plate from Cuba sitting on um, his fireplace. And I looked at it and I saw the numbers. I added them up and he knew because he read my book. He's like, yeah, you can have it. Take it. it adds up to 11. I know you want it. <laughs> um, but it, it, you know, but just as it just like when you um, you fall in and out of sleep, you do the same thing in your waking day. When you're when you're going through your day, you. Um, you're thinking about, oh, I got to pay that bill. And then I have to go to the food store and I have to pick up milk. And, uh, and, uh, I have that work deadline and, you know, you get hungry and you make yourself sandwich. All these things are, are, are distracting you. Uh, and then sometimes you might once think in the day, whoa, there's something beyond me. There's something, it's not just me and I'm the center of the universe. There, there's, there's, a larger universe out there. And we rarely stop and think about that. So we're oftentimes, I say that most of us are sleepwalking. Every day of our lives, we are just sleepwalking. And it is when we become lucid in our dream and awake in the dream, or even awake in your waking life. Not many people are awake in their waking life because they're so distracted by the physicality of life and and. The, the, the emotions and, and all the rantings in their brain and everything. And they're rarely sitting there, you know, thinking about life on a grander level. And so uh, it takes a while uh, to discover, you, you know, you might know that there, there are wings there or you have this potential to fly, but then you get distracted and you turn on Netflix or you go mm -hmm. eat a sandwich and this is the problem. So we're not constantly thinking about our development and growth and our flight potential. So if you thought about it all the time, you'd be sitting there meditating 24 hours a day and you'd, you'd, you'd be, you would become a butterfly, <laughs> You're like for real. <laughs> you might just fly off, <laughs> but we, um, it, it's, it's a process. And, and, but when you're conscious of it and you, you realize 
that you have superpowers, um, then you you just have to focus on it, and and you're constantly being reminded. Like I'll get, you know, you'll get symbols like like feathers will appear in front of you. These are um, these are turkey feathers. There's there's I have turkeys in my backyard that just walk around. Um, so little reminders constantly to wake you up and. Uh, and then um, it's hard then to go back to being asleep because yeah. you, you're once you're aware of the magic of life, it makes you uh, so blissful uh, that it is it you you everything else falls to the side and you're like oh it's all nonsense everything that people are worried about and complaining about and fearful about it's all an illusion so it's it's just it's but you go in and out of these states. Is there an exercise you could teach us about how to wake up in our, you know, not just in our dreams, but in our waking life? Oh, yeah, sure. This is what I do when we go to Ireland. And even if I do just a wor workshop, like I'll do these, um, I'll do these haiku hikes where uh, you're just walking through uh, nature. It's, it's, you have to, it's best to do it in nature because if you're con contained in your four, four walls and distracted by computer and phone and, all, and family, <laughs> then it's, it's not good. So go out alone in nature, uh, go walk in, in a park or the woods or by the beach or a cliff or anything else. Um, and it's, it's all about uh, noticing deeply and using your five senses. So if you pay, much attention to what you're seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, and feeling. And you're listening to the wind and the leaves and you feel it on your skin and you're smelling uh, the fragrance of the outdoors and you're hearing the bird call. Um, that really connects you and grounds you. You feel connected to everything around you. You're part of the dance of the whole of existence and, um, and, and you're breathing with it. It's, it's like, it's it's fluid, so that's that's a good way to do it. Um, and by creating, you know, when I say haiku hike, you're writing a little poem, so you're actually co-creating with the universe. You're writing something and creating something, or you're drawing something, or you're even. I often just use my uh, phone and I take pictures, um, but I'm really I'll I'll really come in close to a flower or a weed or or just the lines in a leaf and 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 focus on something uh, as detailed as that um, just because you're looking at the the art of it the art of nature and because it's reflecting uh, what's inside you as well and if you start communicating on a deep level with the trees and the animals around you um, it's it becomes a spiritual experience, but you feel really alive and you feel really connected to the moment. And that doesn't happen when you're distracted by technology uh, or even someone talking in your ear constantly. Um, so you kind of have to do some things in solitude, some meditation and, and connect with nature in that level. Oh, I love it. Reminds me of a process I, I do and teach people called the Betty Erickson special way of doing self-hypnosis that does basically that. You sit, I do it outside when I can. You can do it indoors, but you, you connect with, you know, three of the five senses, at least, you know, the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, and really take it all in one at a time. Um, taste and, and or smell are, are not usually included in this process, but they could be. I'm not aware that I smell something or taste something, but I love that. I love that. It's beautiful. Um, I know we're running out of time. There's so many questions I want to ask you. So, gosh, um, hmm, where, where should I? Part, part of my interview process is to not ask every question that, I, that pops into my brain and just to let the, some things, you know, unfold naturally. But I'm really curious about um, a, a number of things, so I'm, I'm just not going to stop myself here. Um, when it when it comes to that um, dream team, I had an experience once where I, I'll tell you the story very very quickly. I, I'll leave a lot of details out, but I was. I was driving a car that was new to me, and um, basically, I had I was late at night or early in the morning. Depending, I was driving all night, 
Um, so it was very, very, very early in the morning, let's say about, you know, 536. And I started having this, this dream that said, you know, when, when you crash into the bridge abutment, um, your the steering wheel will crush your chest and your soul will pop out of your body and we'll be here to catch you. Or you could slow down. And suddenly I was <laughs> wide awake. <laughs> suddenly I was wide awake and I pulled in at 6.30 that morning into a rest stop along the thruway, New York State thruway. And um, the previous one had been not open yet. It was too early. So I pulled in this one that finally had some signs of life in it. And I went to the gas station and asked if I could check my tires with their um, air pressure gauge. And uh, one of them was like bizarrely 80 pounds per square inch into this large bubble in it that if it had burst, I would have been, you know, out of control. So it was like, okay, thanks guys. And so, like you said, you don't believe in ghosts until you see a ghost. And it's like, okay, okay, I believe, I believe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Grandma, for visiting. Um, <laughs> but um, what? How, how do? How can people get in touch with their dream team if that was something that they wanted yeah. to do? So um, once I became aware of the dream team, and like I said, we have at least five guides with us at all times. They're like hovering they're all right here they're they never leave your side from the moment you're born they're assigned mm. to you and uh i i did it i i meditated i wanted to see them so i asked uh to actually see them mm. and i i i did a, a meditation and um and they made themselves aware to me and um a few of them uh, were dressed in these biblical robes, which I thought was hysterical because they did that as a joke, being like, oh, this is what you think we look like. Yeah. <laughs> so they had like long beards and they were jumping up and down like, yay, she knows we're, we're she's aware of us. And they were jumping like children, like, woohoo. <laughs> and then, um, so they looked, they had human forms, but I think it was just for me to understand like a message. We're just like you, we're just at a, higher vibration and this is how you understand uh, a helper might look like and mm. then um i saw another vision of uh an owl i don't know if you, i'm wearing owl earrings i realized an owl was one of my spirit animals and i saw it in my mind's eye and i thought oh okay and I, and i i connected with that i understood that owls have night vision and i i'm very aware of my dreams mm -hmm. um and that symbol of the wise uh, owl, I remember my, the dean of the school of education had so many owl ornaments on his desk. And I never, I just thought, oh yeah, it's connected to education. But now it made no sense to me back then. And now I realize it is, it's a symbol of the educator. So I, I, I understand, uh, I understood what that meant to me. And another um, member of the dream team just appeared as a, like a glowing orb. So it's not, it's just light. Mm. And so, um, like I said, we, we, they don't introduce themselves or interfere with our lives unless we ask for help. And those are the moments when, you know, like, like when you think you're going to have an accident and you, you, even if you don't believe in anything, most of us usually go like, Oh, help me. <laughs> you know, whoever, you don't know who you're talking to, but you're just like, I need help. <laughs> and, and you do get it. Like you don't get hit by that bus or whatever. Um, but uh, you can, I've, I've even, I've suggested to some of my clients um, invite uh, your guides to enter your dreams and share information with you. When you wake up, you may not remember, but you, you might have a deeper sense of calm and you don't know why the next day. I once had a, a client tell me uh, she was recently widowed and she had dated her husband since, you know, they met when they were 16 and, and um, she just missed him so much. It had been six months since uh, he died. And uh, I said, well, tonight I want you to um, invite him into your dream. Uh, because she wanted, she just said, I wish I could see him again. And it would be nice to go on one more date together. So I told her, just tell him to come into your dream because he's not going to, he doesn't want to scare you. And he's, his spirit doesn't want to. In, in, you know, sometimes it might make your presence known, like you'll hear a song on the radio and it's him. That's his way of saying hello. But you're you just think of him and that's it. So the very next morning, she called me and she said, I can't believe your suggestion worked. 
I invited him into my dream and he actually was there and they went on a rowboat and they had a picnic and she had a lovely time and they had a nice conversation. And she said, Tara, it felt real. And I said, it's because it was real. We, we can't dismiss our dreams. Uh, they are real and, and it's, it's our soul speaking to us and it's our guides and ancestors and loved ones visiting us. And um, so it's very powerful. So I just wish more people connected with their dreams. Well, maybe they will after today. Thank you, Tara O'Grady. We're going to have to stop, I'm afraid. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but we can do this again sometime if you'd sure. be so. Yeah, it'd be lovely to have you hear more about this. And if people do want to get hold of you, it's taraogrady.com, is it? Uh, well, there's taraogradymusic.com and there's butterflycoach.org. And both of them have uh, my upcoming tours to Ireland and Tuscany. And uh, also about my um, my books. Uh, my new book is being published in a few months called The Gods of Clown Alley. And it uh, just goes deeper into um, ways to self-heal and to find bliss. Very cool. And the first book is called, um, was it, did I pick it up right, that it was called um, Migrating Towards Happiness? Yes. And that's already, that's on, that's on all the platforms already. All right. Very cool. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's good to see. You. I'm so glad I ran into you the other night. It must have been <laughs> our guides brought us together. <laughs> well, let's all give thanks. See you again real soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye for now. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Central Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks.